Welcome back. In this next video, I'm going to talk about how we actually build a portfolio using asset allocation and some basic financial planning techniques. So I'll start off talking about the most identifiable characteristics that you need to consider. We'll talk about the main objectives for most individuals, and then I'll show you the planning steps for some of the big industry organizations. Okay, so what factors actually drive the composition of a portfolio that's managed individually? Well, there are three main objectives here. The characteristics of the individual investor and the individual investor's actual objectives. The portfolio's objectives, which will very often mirror the investor's objectives. And then portfolio policies, any specific policies that we want to put into place to make sure that this portfolio is not mismanaged. So when you're building your own portfolio, what do you need to consider? Well, this is by no means a, an exhaustive list, but these are certainly things that you would want to collect. Your level of income and stability of your income. If you're not in a stable position, you may want to have a more liquid portfolio. Your net worth. If you're a high net worth investor, you may be able to take on more risk. Your age and family factors. If you're older, you may not want to take on as much risk. If you've got a lot of aging family members and you're 55 year old, years old yourself, you may not want to be illiquid or have an illiquid portfolio. You'd also want to consider your own personal level of risk aversion or risk tolerance. So if you're very risk averse, you're probably not going to be comfortable investing everything in very, very risky growth stocks or international equity. Uh, risk capacity goes right along with that. If you don't have the ability to take risk because you need some additional liquidity, some cash, then in putting everything in, say, private equity is obviously not going to be appropriate. The time horizon? Absolutely. You want to know how many years you have to invest. If you've got a long time horizon, then you can afford to take more risk. Tax considerations? If you're in a high tax bracket, then you're probably not going to want to receive oh, dividends or interest income from bonds, that's going to drive what goes into your portfolio. Liquidity, the general rule for individuals is that you have between three and six months worth of liquid assets, whether that's cash or checking accounts or saving accounts or whatever. You just want to be liquid with about three to six months worth of expenses sitting around and easily accessible. In education level, also important. If you or someone you're helping doesn't have a good background in finance or they don't really understand the time value of money, uh, you would definitely not want to be taking a lot of risks or putting your money in some assets that are very, very complicated. Of course, you know, you're going through my class, so I would say that you have certainly above average understanding of, well, investments and the various asset classes. And finally, estate plans. So estate plans, if you've got a, a general sense that you want to leave everything to your kids or to a charity or something, you may not want to take excess risks. You may not want to uh, consume a lot. So you may actually have some, some unique characteristics for your portfolio that you know this, these would require you to consider. Okay, next, what are some common portfolio objectives? Now, I would say these top two are the most common. You know, current income, if you're, let's say, a, an older investor, you know, someone in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you're, you might be what we call a pensioner, especially if you're past retirement age. You, know, you might live on your income, uh, and then you might want to try and preserve your capital. So this objective is typically very common of older individuals. For younger individuals, we're more focused on capital growth. So take higher risk investments because they historically have yielded higher returns. So common stock, real estate, private equity, et cetera. Uh, so that includes high beta stocks, weights increased in speculative investments. Now, there are some other characteristics that we sometimes want to consider. So managing risk. I mean, there is a risk return trade-off, so you don't want to take on too much risk, even though it might increase your return. Uh, and then finally, uh, reducing taxes, that can sometimes be a, a sub uh, secondary objective. 
So if you're a high net worth investor, yeah, you might seek high capital growth, but because you're in the highest tax bracket, you may not want to invest in any assets that pay out current income or require payouts of any kind. Okay, so how do we actually allocate funds? Well, there are a couple of different approaches and there's way more approaches than I have listed here, but we can sometimes use a fixed weighting approach. In this approach, we just allocate a certain percentage of our portfolio to every asset, either at the start of the portfolio period or every single period where we're investing new funds. We can also use a flexible weighting approach where we adjust the weights uh, based on market analysis. So if we think that stocks as a whole are undervalued, in this next period, we increase our weight into common equity. And then finally, there is the tactical asset allocation approach, very similar to this flexible weighting approach, where we have a sense of the range that our portfolio should take, let's say between 40 and 60% common stocks. If we think that common stocks are undervalued, we would generally want to increase our weight in common stocks all the way up from, we'll say 45%, all the way up to 60%. So this tactical asset allocation approach means that we have some set bounds of each asset class and we adjust our weights inside of those bounds that we've already set. All right, so what do some alternative asset allocations actually look like? Well, here we have three examples, a low risk, an average risk, and a high risk portfolio. Uh, so the low risk, we typically are going to have a lower percentage in common stock, a higher percentage in bonds, and a higher percentage in short-term securities like money market mutual funds. Up in the high risk portfolio, we've got a higher concentration or a higher weight in stocks, other foreign securities. I mean, quite frankly, there are certain asset classes like stocks, and so public equity, private equity, hedge funds, uh, futures, options. These are going to be our high risk assets. And then bonds, liquid assets are typically going to be our low risk assets. Okay, so how do you actually employ asset allocation? Well, there's a couple of main approaches, but the general way that we do this is step one, we analyze the economic outlook, we try to assess the expected returns of each asset class, and we also will have already done our homework and assessed our own risk tolerance, uh, our own need for taxation, our own uh, objectives, our own uh, you know, other characteristics. So all of this stuff you're always going to want to do regardless of your asset allocation approach. At the end of every period, you're also going to want to review your portfolio. So once you've invested and we're at the end of the period, say the year, how did you do? Did you meet your objectives? If not, should you readjust your portfolio? Uh, which Should you rebalance your assets? And there are some tricks out there to essentially help you. Uh, a lot of investors, including myself, we diversify our portfolios simply by holding managed funds. So ETFs, mutual funds, these typically have low costs, low expense ratios, and you know, especially if you've got a very small portfolio, they're very cost effective and allow you to diversify very easily. We also want to make sure that we're investing for the long term. We don't want to be day traders. Uh, you never want to be a day trader, so I always recommend the stocks or other assets that you're investing in, you need to invest in assets that you think will be valuable over the next long term or five years. And then try to fight the temptation to deviate from that plan. If let's say you've got a real problem, you're very, very risk averse, and the first time the market tanks, you pull your money out, well, you're always gonna earn a capital loss. Uh, so that's, that's not a good idea. You want to invest for the long term and try not to touch your assets for a very long time. Okay, so uh, just to sum up this video or wrap up this video, I did want to show you the main techniques that two of the top industry organizations recommend for managing portfolios. So we'll start with the CFP board. So the CFP professionals typically follow a six-step process when advising their clients' individual portfolios. And here it is. So like I said, six-step process. Step one, 
establish the relationship with the client. And uh, so this obviously we would skip because you're managing your own portfolios. Step two, collect the client's information. So all of that stuff I mentioned at the beginning of the video, you're collecting it right here. You take that, you assess your, you know, your clients or your, your own financial status. So identify everything that you need to consider, develop a financial plan, and then decide whether it's appropriate, make any changes you need, and then implement it. And then finally, at the end of the period, whether that's semi-annually or quarterly or annually, you want to review your performance. Or you know, if it's a financial planner, you review the client's performance. Now, the other main organization whose process I thought I should mention is the CFA Institute. And the CFA Institute, they have a straightforward process. I mean, it's very similar. The planning step, the execution step, the monitoring step. Uh, three steps. Now, this is typically for managed portfolios, so actual portfolios containing many people's money, but the process is fairly similar to that of the CFP board. Basically, step one, identify your expectations for asset classes, uh, identify your objective, your risk tolerance, and then in step two, this is your execution step, you make your trades. You invest in assets that you believe are undervalued. You might short assets that you think are overvalued. And finally, in the monitoring step, that's where you analyze your performance. So you take a look at how you did, probably relative to a benchmark, or maybe you look at some advanced uh, metrics, and then you reallocate and rebalance your portfolio. Okay, so let's recap. When you're allocating capital to your asset classes, you always want to consider three main things. Your objectives, your portfolio objectives, so your individual and your portfolio objectives, and then finally, your portfolio policies. So what are the red lines? What are the lines you're not going to cross? There are, however, many ways to allocate your capital. I mean, there are so many, I didn't even bother listing them here. Uh, we'll talk about those in some other videos and certainly in class. And then different asset classes are going to offer different risk return behaviors. So stocks, hedge funds, real estate, uh, these are the asset classes that are going to give you the high returns, but also require you to take on more risk. So you need to be very comfortable taking risk if you're going to be investing in those assets. So that's that, and I will follow up with this information on the next video. So thank you very much.